Hello, welcome to our show. We are Business Love with Ryan. I am Ryan. Here we focus on what it takes to make your ideas happen and the steps you can follow to make it just a little bit easier. Subscribe to our podcast to join the ongoing conversation about all things startup business related. Find even more content on our YouTube channel, Ryan's Business Class. See the link in our description of this episode. So glad to have you here. Maybe we can learn something together. Enjoy. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to Business Love with Ryan podcast. I am Ryan, as usual. And I'd like to welcome you to our second ever podcast. We've uh, seen a lot happen in the last week, uh, both in our community and in the world. In our community, we went from about 10 subscribers on YouTube to now like 18. I'm very happy for each one of you. I hope you get something out of what I'm doing. And uh, I think of you when I make my content. Um, And you know, there's been a lot happening in the world too. Uh, Coronavirus continues to spread. And it's demonstrated a a new reality that's starting to become more apparent. We don't know how long it's going to last. But what it is is a quarantined, isolated reality. You go to the gym, there's not that many people there. Um, You go to the supermarket, you know, there's more people there than probably anywhere else. But social engagements, restaurants are half full, trains are half full, airplanes are less than half full. The world is just wide open as people stay home. But they're, those same people are still doing things. And what are they doing? Well, they're using their uh, resources at home. They're spending time together. They're watching movies. Uh, they're using the internet more. And it's, so it's really great for internet-based content, perhaps such as the content that we're creating here, or uh, platforms such as Udemy, or uh, you know, porn sites, I guess. They're, they're getting more views than they're normal because there's people with a lot more time. Udemy is an online education course where you can boost your skills in different areas. For instance, um, if you want to learn about photography or if you want to learn about uh, coding or if you want to learn about music, you can go to Udemy and there's teachers who have published content that will help you learn a little bit better. Pornhub, even though that's not so interesting to everybody, but what they've done is in areas where people are quarantined, they've been giving away their services for free. And so has Udemy. They've been giving away their services for free, and then you assume that people are going to be consuming it at a very high rate now. And what that's also doing is creating customer loyalty, and it's cementing a uh, customer experience that they will be likely to pay for in the future. So these companies aren't necessarily being charitable or giving away their product for free. What they're doing is they're uh, incentive marketing to their clients or to potential clients. And um, I think there's a real good opportunity to uh, think about the future and think about what this could mean for your business ideas. If people are going to stay home, how will your business thrive? If you're a fitness trainer, how will you be able to take advantage of people who are staying at home? Well, for instance, maybe you could prepare some video courses about fitness regimens and exercises that people can do in their own home. Uh, They'll be more likely to watch it right now because they're going to be looking for it specifically. Um, You know, there's Udemy, there's Coursera, there's uh, others. And all of them kind of have the same idea right now. So you're going to be competing with them uh, with your own content. You could think about joining one of these sites and getting involved with them. And, um, you know, maybe your content will be given away for free for a little while, but you'll have people who are much likely to come back later. Not only do you get that exposure, you're able to, you know, connect your social media with this video content. And suddenly you have a surge of people who are likely to see it is the trade-off that maybe you're going to lose some people who would have likely paid for it that now get it for free? Yes, maybe. But these are the times, and you need to be able to adapt to the times. Um, Take some risks. You know, is it this way? Nobody's quite sure. Will it be this way tomorrow? (coughs) We're not sure. I think I have coronavirus. That's what I'm thinking right now. Anyways, let's talk about what the economy is going to look like assuming coronavirus doesn't go away. Let's say that everyone has to buy a hazmat suit and this is the future. It wouldn't be that wrong. Next time a virus pops up, everyone jumps into their hazmat suits for a couple of months, problem solved. But 
We hope it doesn't come to that. We hope the government gets their fingers around this a little bit faster, gets a vaccine out, or maybe figures out a nutrition regimen or a, a, a certain type of medicine that represses this uh, virus. But, you know, think about posting more online. Think about, you know, stepping up your online game now because this is the time when there's eyes to see it. There's a certain land grab quality to this situation because you have people at home that are not likely to be at home in the future and haven't been at home so much before. Uh, and, you know, you think about what the future economy is going to be, assuming we don't get out of our houses. Let's say this virus mutates and takes a turn for the worst, and suddenly we really are quarantined to survive. What's that look like? Well, that looks like remote workforces. That looks like video games are going to become much more popular. Probably pornography. I hate to say it, but that's a leading industry in, on the Internet these days. It, ha it always has been. Um, it's only going to uh, increase. Uh, for instance, Pornhub had this great uh, advertisement that said, you can touch yourself, which means you can't touch other people. People go to Pornhub. This is what they do. So it's clever. And it demonstrates a, a response to what's going on right now. It's kind of macabre if you think about it, but what are you going to do? Um, but, you know, also I would say that video games have a much bigger place in the future than they did in the past. Uh, video games, virtual reality, augmented reality. So I want to make that our Tech Tuesday section. Yeah, so here we are. We have Tech Tuesday, and I want to talk about the video game industry first. You know, there's a certain condition going on in the video game industry these days where you can download the game for free and you pay for all kinds of stuff in the game. I am currently trapped in one of these business models. My very favorite game on the internet is called Raid Shadow Legends. I play it on my phone, I play it on my computer, probably an hour a day, sometimes a little bit more. And it's just fantastic. And there's all sorts of opportunities to spend money to advance in the game, which is not fantastic. But that there's a certain immediacy to the game. You can spend money. It's just somehow closer to real life. You know, you take your money, you buy the stuff you want in the game. And then you have the stuff. You feel like you own it. You feel like... Uh, this is my life and it's happening right now. I'm an extension of these characters. These characters are my team. I've actually put some of my money into it. So I remember, you know, sacrificing for the game somehow. It's, it's a weird feeling in a way, but it makes it more real. It makes it more alive. And then there's the arena area where your team, you can bring a team to go fight other players and you can see who's better. And then it brings in your competitiveness. And it's like, I have to be better. I have to win. So I'm willing to spend a little real dollars, you know, $10, $20 on a weapon or some special armor or another character. Um, and what's really interesting about this game is that when you spend the money, you don't always get the character. Sometimes you get it. There's a chance of missing. There's a chance of a misroll. And that makes it even better. Like... You're terribly disappointed when you spent some of your in-game silver to try to upgrade your armor and it didn't work. But when it does work, oh, the dopamine rush that floods your soul is, it's, it's better than anything you get in real life. I'm ashamed to say, you know, artificial reality. We're not designed for it through evolution. We are victims to our own technology. However, it is pretty clear that the direction we're going is deeper into that. And so there's a video game on the screen right now. You see it, you pay for it, you know it's, you know, you can walk away. But what happens when you put the helmet on? What happens when you put the helmet on and wear it around? And you can sort of see your life and there's an overlay on it. That could be a game taking place in your living room as you're walking down the street. Imagine if there's a sniper peeking around the corner and you can shoot him and it's in your real world, it's in your real neighborhood. Or virtual reality, where you stay at home and you're just in another world. Um, 
a virtual classroom, a virtual sporting event. What if we can't go to sporting events anymore like we used to uh, because of coronavirus or uh, something like it? You know, if it comes now and we know that there's all sorts of viruses in laboratories around the world, it, it's going to come again. Get your hazmat suit. Save up your money, buy a hazmat suit. It's the end outcome. If you have your hazmat suit, they can't hurt you. Why not make hazmat suits a little bit more stylish? That's the other thing. I want to talk about that in a minute. But for now, we're talking about virtual reality. So, business ideas of the future in the corona quarantine environment that obviously is going to look more towards perhaps virtual reality than before. You know, you go into the game and you change the game the way you like it so that, okay, it's still a game, it's not real, but the, the behaviors that you did uh, stay that way. So they're like settings that you decided on and that took time to do. The developer of the game isn't going to go do that. So you can actually go into these virtual environments and do work. You can make them the way that they are. You can build a, a palace inside a virtual reality world. And yes, the developer could have built the same palace, but he didn't. So the work you do is still going to be artistically yours. And maybe you design clothes in virtual reality and you sell them to other people who want to have these clothes. I know from a, for a fact that from my Raid Shadow Legends experience, people will pay for the clothes. People will pay for the clothes. And so, you know, you go into virtual reality. Oh, this is where I'm doing work. Maybe you're not creating virtual food for other people. Maybe you're not, uh, you know, building their actual house that they need to be sheltered from the environment. But you're doing a lot of things that have to do with their entertainment and their perception of reality. And these things have tremendous value, probably more value than just food. I could put food into myself. Maybe in the future we just have an IV that goes down our throat and we are completely in virtual reality all the time like the Matrix. Well, the real breadwinners in that environment are the people who are creating the virtual reality reality. Maybe you do make your own game company. Or maybe you're just somebody who goes into the game and changes it. You know, uses the in-game tools to make things that people can have and enjoy. I don't know. But we do know that people are going to stay home. And we used to laugh at it before, go out and have fun, go out and play. Well, now you might die. So we stay at home, you know, in a unpleasant situation, technically, because you can't leave. Maybe you're, you know, everything's closed. You don't want, you know, strangers coming in. Uh, you don't want to interact with anybody else. So you stay at home. You're in your house and uh, you're just going to go deeper into the screen. So this is the, the sort of um, environment I perceive in the future. You know, and then you ask yourself, uh, we wanted to talk on uh, our business supermodel section about uh, freelancing uh, on platforms because we think the future is probably going to be more remote workforces. And I've said already um, that it's probably going to be um, not even workforces, but freelancers interacting with each other like a, like a cobweb or like a net or like a network. So, uh, or both, some combination thereof, but it's independent freelancers and remote workforces, which in a way are almost going to be the same thing. So uh, we'll talk about that in business supermodels. Okay, so we have this concept that remote workforces are going to be the actual workforces of the future. Why do we need an office? Why do we need offices in the first place? Maybe it's a place where the boss can make sure work is taking place. It gives people a place where they focus a little bit better, where they have office supplies, where they have coworkers that they can you know, discuss with and lean on. And what would be lost? What would be lost if those coworkers stayed at home? or if they went to the swimming pool and did their work on their laptop from the pool, or if they went uh, on a vacation somewhere, or they just stayed at home. Uh, 
what would be lost from the traditional work environment if that happened? Well, probably that face-to-face, -face, that communicability. However, I would say that, for instance, telegram groups. If everyone has telegram on their phone and they're tied into a group, it's actually even more integrated than we had, let's say, 20 years ago. It's a more integrated workforce than ever before. People can ask each other questions, drop of a hat, without having to get up and uh, ask uh, their employee in the, on, the, on the third floor, you know, go into the elevator, go down, ask a question, and come back up. Maybe before you could pick up a phone. Now you pick up text, you could set it down, you don't have to wait. It's just, I documented my question, it'll be answered within the next 30 minutes, I can go back to my work. It's like lightning. It's like um, immediacy. It's uh, as you think it. And additionally, we could talk about what it means to manage a workforce. We could talk about, if you're a company, what it means to uh, you know, have a large group of people that answer to you remotely. But I think for now, we want to talk about what it means for the individual. If you're an individual and you want to become a freelancer in some specific skill, for instance, um, writing business plans or uh, doing some coding or, you know, uh, writing jingles for commercials, you can sign up at, uh, for platforms and uh, you will uh, have an account, you'll have payment processing so that anybody can go to your listing on that platform and buy it. Anybody. So even if you're not saying, I want to be exclusively tied to this platform, even if you're actually saying, I just want to be a freelancer, it's still okay to uh, use these platforms as your primary uh, uh, home, let's say, the home of your business because these platforms have payment processing built right into them and they have customer arbitration built right into them. So the client, especially if you're a new freelancer, is much more likely to, uh, to purchase your services uh, without uh, unnecessary re uh, research or, you know, they won't be so hesitant because there is an arbitration system and it's, it's convenient, it's a, it's a clean process. There's a, a, a clean experience when they uh, purchase your service as a unit of service through a platform. So there's two platforms that I want to focus on. Uh, the first one is Upwork. And Upwork is a little bit more serious, whereas the second one is Fiverr. F-I-V-E-R and then another R. So F-I-V-E-R-R.com, Fiverr.com. And I'm not sure as companies they would agree with this next statement, but I would say that Upwork is a little bit more serious. Therefore, people who say, I have an hourly rate, let's negotiate how many hours this task will take. It's not a, a united uh, a product that you can buy without negotiation. You would want to contact this worker. Let's say it's a, a, an HTML specialist, not so advanced work. So maybe this guy is from uh, Bolivia and he's an HTML specialist, you'll be able to see how many stars he has, how many people he's served. Maybe he's had 100 customers and gotten 15 reviews, or maybe he's had, uh, you know, 3,000 jobs, and he's got 4.7 stars after, you know, 1,300 reviews. And you can go in and read his work. You can see what he charges. You can be sure that as his... Uh, ratings have increased, he's increased his price to go with it. So in the beginning, he would have started cheaply. I have no reputation. I have no reviews. So maybe my services are $15 an hour. After I have 100, maybe I'll go up to 20. After I have 500, maybe I'll go up to 30. You know, and then once you have 1,000 and you have a record that's been consistent, maybe you feel that the truly appropriate price for your services is, let's say, you know, $125 an hour. You know, you're very good and you have a truck record to prove it. Now, 
if you want to sign up, sign up for Fiverr, Fiverr is a little bit more uh, packaged services in terms of selling it like a product. So you'll say that, uh, for instance, I will write your business plan and there will be this, 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 and this, and it's this much money. And then there's, there's up, up, uh, uh, upsell features. In other words, I can add an extra page or I can add a few extra references to the bottom, or I can add a more in-depth description to certain sections of your business plan. Um, or maybe they do resumes. Maybe you meet somebody who does resumes. So you'll buy their service, you know, your basic resume package. Maybe they have a gold package too. But it's all very product-oriented, that even though you're receiving a service, it's structured like you're taking a product off the shelf. And you know exactly what you're going to get. Uh, there'll be some follow-up in terms of delivering that service. Like if they're going to write a resume for you, they're going to need you to submit all the information. And if they're really worth their salt, they're, they're going to ask for a phone interview as well. So you're going to call them on the phone. Hello, nice to talk with you. Okay, let's go through this checklist of information. And so uh, Fiverr is a little bit more one-time only kind of jobs. Uh, Upwork is a little bit more ongoing. If you wanted to build a truly remote workforce in the most convenient way possible, and know that you and, and know that you're getting recruits who are calibrated towards this lifestyle already because they've already signed up for Upwork. If you're taking people off Monster, you might find some people who are truly apt to doing this type of uh, experience, but you'll find other people who are not. They need the office and they weren't expecting to find a remote workforce job necessarily. It's all kinds of people. But if you go directly to Upwork to build your remote uh, workforce, then you will have uh, a collection of people who are already predisposed towards the type of work you're going to ask them to do. Uh, so let's assume that you are a freelancer and you decide, okay, I'll get started on Fiverr first. And then when I get a little bit more, uh, perhaps you'll use your Fiverr feedback as credibility towards your Upwork account later. I don't see why you wouldn't start both of them at the same time and then just get them both going in succession. Have them both go to the same email so that you can just check your email and you can know what's happening on both. You don't want to like uh, use an email that you'll never use and then you know not see the business that comes in. And probably before it sales, it'll come in in the form of questions. And you're going to want to uh, you're going to want to be right there to answer those questions when they come. Um, so you set up your profile. Your profile is set up. Let's just talk about uh, Fiverr for now. Your profile is set up, and you've decided what service you want to offer. Let's say you're going to be a coding specialist. And so you set up your Fiverr and you say, uh, I can do this amount of work. Uh, let's say you sell your services in our bundles. I will do five hours of work towards your project for $99. And I'll do an extra three hours of work for an additional $40. So there's a little discount if you want to take the upsell and get eight hours of work total. Now, um, you set that up and maybe the network will notice you, will notice that your deal is good and it will sort of start to suggest you to the community. People will eventually find you, but there's another way to do it as well. And even though the Fiverr or Upwork community gives you opportunities to promote yourself, and gives you a sort of a, a pool where you're mixed in with a lot of other people and maybe sometimes some people will find you. Uh, maybe you uh, get really good reviews so they start to recommend you. But this way is slow. There's another way. And that is even though Upwork or Fiverr is your home, is a base of operations for you that does payment processing, which is critical, uh, they... Uh, you can still get clients from the world. Tell them, yes, welcome to my services and uh, feel free to pay me over Fiverr or feel free to pay me over, over Upwork. Select my listing. When you share your services with people, you send them a link to that listing. The only problem with this, even though there is a benefit in terms of a customer sense of security and a certain added professionalism, I suppose. It's not totally professional as if having your own website and just working off that and being very advanced and, you know, having a, a 300 person firm underneath you, maybe a remote, remote workforce. But 
Um, it still has a professional appearance and it gives that arbitration and it gives that payment processing. So it's a one-stop shop. So it's a great way to get started. Uh, it's a great way to present yourself to customers outside of the Fiverr network. You can start to develop your social media in conjunction with it. I'm a great coder. Here's my social media that talks about me as a coder. Uh, you can also have LinkedIn, of course. And when you know when you when you hook a fish outside of the network, you can bring them to the network, and this will uh, also improve your feedback. And eventually, the network will pick you up and carry you to a much higher level, as all social media does when you're popular. So it would be just like with YouTube. Maybe you have a YouTube channel, and you hope that YouTube will make you famous all by all by themselves. But for a vast majority of us, that's not going to happen. Maybe we're doing serious content like now, not so entertaining, much more, uh, you know, what does it mean? How do you do business? You know, or maybe it's, um, it's uh, just not the sort of thing that becomes very popular on YouTube very quick. So you can bring outsiders in to look at your content and boost you to the network, perhaps. Uh, for instance, if you have a uh, Instagram that can send traffic to your YouTube, your YouTube will become much more popular, uh, of course. So that's what you want to do. You want to sign up and you want to define your service and you need to know how to do the thing that you're doing. So educating yourself, of course, comes first as usual with every business that we're doing we're educating ourselves not only are we educating ourselves about the service we want to provide we're educating ourselves about the fiverr and for instance uh upwork platforms we're educating ourselves about the rules and best practices and hints and tricks we want to know all of that stuff you know and you're educating yourself about the thing that you're providing your service to you constantly want to be getting better at whatever you do and as a freelancer that's even more true you want to be on the cutting edge you don't want to be a freelancer who's mediocre that's no fun you want to truly be good that justifies your independence okay so uh the second step is establish yourself sign up for your platforms and you want to have companion social media as well and i don't see why you don't have a website as well so you have your platforms first, that is your home. Unfortunately, uh, your website uh, becomes second to your platforms when you're in this situation. But you still need it because it gives you credibility and it gives you an independent uh, place to call home as well. Uh, Upwork can shut you down, Fiverr can shut you down, but nobody can shut down your website. So um, you wanna have that up, you wanna have your social media, you wanna populate your social media uh, with content. Uh, you know, but also relevant contact information. That is the most important thing. Give people a way to contact you. And your social media gives you a messaging feed. Uh, Fiverr gives you a messaging feed as well, and so does Upwork. And your website probably should too. It's just all more ways for people to communicate. Highly recommend it all comes back to the same email so that you can look in the same place and uh, know everything at once. Uh, so then, you know, uh, you want to uh, define your product. You know, what are you providing? What are your services? What do you want to do? What are you unwilling to do? Uh, if you do coding, uh, are you, uh, how do you want to package it? By the hour, by the job? Uh, which sort of coding do you specialize in? You want to learn how to categorize it in the, um, in the platform. So it's not just about what you do, it's how you post it. So it's posted on the platform in a way that's attractive and competitive. Uh, you have your credentials in the post. I uh, want to make sure you talk about what's good about you. Um, you can never be too informative to the customer. So then from this point, you need to market your product and you can't necessarily expect the platform to do it for you because you want to hit the ground running. So you sign up on these platforms, but then you're out on LinkedIn and you're in social media and you know, you're in Twitter and you're contacting business leaders and uh, you're contacting uh, startups and you're contacting um, small businesses and saying, you know, I have a service I can provide you and I'll give you a good price. Maybe I'll take a commission. Uh, maybe I'll uh, take half now. Uh, there's all sorts of attractive ways. I had a guy on a plane one time from Spain. I, I, I sat next to him. I never got his contact information again, but it's one of those conversations that you will always remember. 
and he was a little bit older than me. And he, uh, what he did was he decided where he wanted to travel. And then he would go on LinkedIn and just contact CEOs in the place where he wanted to be. He, uh, and he encouraged me to do this business, but I, you know, had my own goals and, uh, I talked with him quite a bit about the way it worked though. And, um, he said, I contact a CEO, I tell them what I do specifically, and I invite them to eat with me. So we meet for a lunch and uh, I tell them all about what I can do. They, when they arrive at the lunch, they already know what it is. And so this allows him to live in any country he wants. He lived in Mongolia for a couple of years, serving Mongolian business leaders on social media. And now he lived in uh, Czech Republic and uh, he just was free because he had developed a system and developed a skill that he could freelance to the public. And um, so you don't necessarily need these platforms. You could go right on LinkedIn and, and start with it. So it actually should be both together. Uh, you can lead people from LinkedIn to your Upwork platform. It's, it's, uh, it's acceptable to the business community. The business startup community is very familiar with Upwork. So it's a trusted name. So when you're involved with them, people can take a little bit more of a sigh of relief. <sighs> okay, I can deal with Upwork. They have arbitration, no problem. Let's put some money towards this person and see if they deliver on their promises. Um, and I believe Quarantine or no quarantine, the workforce of the future is one that focuses on independent freelancers. We're gonna all gonna be independent freelancers providing independent services to one of one another, like a like a cobweb. Because where you whereas you used to need ten people to provide a certain function, it's just you with some applications now. And it just it comes down to. Uh, writing down your plan and just going through the steps as quickly as possible. Speed is the most important feature in today's modern setup. You know, plan your steps and rush, jump, move as fast as you can because they're all free. So the only way you're going to win is if you run. Um, you know, uh, finally, you deliver your product so people pay for it. You make sure you do a good job, obviously. You know, so you know you have educate yourself, uh, establish yourself, define your product, market your product, like we've talked about. You have in system and out of system, but now it's deliver your product. Somebody purchased from you. If it's on Fiverr, they purchased with, let's say, um, uh, they bought uh, your basic package. They didn't upsell. They just wanted the basic and you promised in your listing it'll be ready in 48 hours. It needs to be ready. And I would say that it needs to be a little bit impressive. I purchased a business plan off of Fiverr one time. I paid $49 for it. And he said, all right, send me what information, tell me what it is. Well, okay. I want to make a business, da, 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 da. I sent it to him. And all he did was cut and paste what I said into the different sections. And if I hadn't said it, he didn't use his imagination at all to fill in the blanks. You know, he had a section about uh, what are initial expenses. Well, I hadn't said what the initial expenses were, so it was empty. So I, I called Fiverr and I got my money back. No question. The guy spent about 15 minutes completing the task and I spent $49 for it. He should have spent easily three hours doing it. At least two. $25 an hour, okay, it's not a deal but whatever. But he obviously spent almost no time. It was almost like he had maybe put an AI on it to extract terminology out of my words because it was just meager. So I paid for it from somebody else and I got a good, I got a good one back. So I, I left them a good review. I left a bad review for the other guy and um, that's just the way it works. I highly recommend you think about it. I highly recommend you consider using uh, one of these platforms. Even if you already have a job, start providing your own independent service uh, as a freelancer and it's really one step closer to being an independent uh, business owner. It's a real step. Good luck with it.
Okay, so, you know, going back to the strategy now section, let's talk about what the worst case scenario of this coronavirus really looks like. Um, I think it couldn't get any worse than everyone wearing hazmat suits everywhere they go. I mean, if everyone has their own personal hazmat suit, then there's nothing to hurt you. It doesn't look so fantastic. It sort of alarms you every time you look around and everyone you see is in a yellow hazmat suit. But it would be the there could be no regression further than that. If we had 7 billion hazmat suits in the world right now, everyone could put one on. Some people would have coronavirus inside their bubble, but it wouldn't be spread. There would just be no way for it to spread. Uh, certain industries would continue to take, uh, take a hit. For instance, anything that requires physical contact would definitely suffer. Uh, probably the beauty industry would suffer, people would kind of, you know, forego haircuts for a while or professional cosmetic application or anything like that, that would suffer. But the point is, life would go on for the most part. Uh, farmers could still go into the field in their hazmat suit. People could still go to the office in their hazmat suit. Uh, you know, sports are not taking place, so events are still suffering. Uh, you know, restaurants are probably too, but you can get to the supermarket, you can uh, get to the post office, uh, you can go to the buy medicine, uh, you can go to church, I suppose. Um, so certain elements of normal life will continue, and it would only be for a couple of months. If everyone put on a hazmat suit right now, a month from now, there would be no more coronavirus because how would it spread? It would be in the people it's in, and then it would pass away. Probably we would have to disinfect the inside of their hazmat suit, but that would be the end of it. But we don't have that yet, so people are in their houses. That would not be forever. But let's also remember that this is also going to be uh, controlled eventually too. Once they start having better tests, once they start having vaccines, it's over. It's over. What would be cheaper? Vaccines for everybody or hazmat suits for everybody? I'm not 100%. It'd be an unpleasant experience to have to dress this way for, you know, a month. So, but that would solve it. So, what does this mean for companies? Well, I think it means, and it's probably true with this quarantine environment or not, but companies are probably going to move towards remote workforces a lot more. We've talked about what it it means to be a, a freelancer, so a member of a remote workforce, technically. But what does it mean to be a business founder? So you start a small business, you, uh, you have your computer in front of you, and you want to start assembling services in such a way that creates a, a profitable product for a third party. So you go on Fiverr and you pick four or five specialists and you coordinate them. Maybe you can convince them to work for you for a really good price since it's a new company and it won't take up all their time and they can be part of something from the ground floor or whatever. Uh, but you could assemble them from Upwork and, uh, you know, manage a workforce and they're remote too. Maybe you're all on the beach. Maybe you see each other on vacation and don't even know it, but the company is still functioning along. Um, I think even if there is no quarantine environment, there's a really attractive uh, reality that we're discussing here for anybody. Uh, if you're starting a business now and you at least don't have some of your workforce remotely, uh, I think you're missing out on a real opportunity because you can save money. Uh, and it's convenient in a whole in, in other ways too. You, you, you're dealing with people who are geared towards mobile, geared towards internet. So they're going to be perhaps much more available than, uh, than uh, well, I guess people in your own office are available too, but um, it's cheaper. I guess that's really the bottom line. It's, it's less money. You pay them less money. You don't have to pay them, you know, for their Medicare and Medicaid and, you know, uh, workers insurance. Uh, they have to pay taxes for themselves. Um, and you just never know what the environment is going to look like in the near future. So as a company, or if you're thinking about starting a business right now, I personally would be thinking about going 100% remote. That way, I don't have to come to the office either. I don't even need an office. Something to think about. And there is a general belief in the investment community that this is going to pass. 
And honestly, when you want a sense of what the world really thinks is going to happen in the future, uh, the moment people feel like this is going to pass in three weeks or three months, and we, we feel like we see the end of it or we see the controlled situation of it, the stock market is going to shoot up like a rocket. It's going to shoot up like a rocket. Right now, we don't know when the vaccine will be. We don't know when uh, uh, we can contain this. Uh, we don't know what the true death rates are. And all of this sort of uh, creates uncertainty, which makes the stock market crash. But generally, the leaders of the stock market believe that this is human reaction. And even if it's not human reaction, we will get over it. And uh, Carl Icahn, who's one of my favorite investors, uh, he said that right now he believes stocks are just being given away. People are just giving them away for free. And these are American businesses or successful international businesses. And they're being sold for 50% off, 50 cents on the dollar. When you know that once coronavirus passes away, one month later, these stocks are going to be back up to what they were. Imagine an opportunity to profit 50% in a short period of time. It sounds good if you're buying and selling products. Yeah, 50% markup is normal, but there's work associated with that. We're talking about passive investment. You put it in, bang, doubles. That is a very clear opportunity that's happening in all sorts of stocks right now, all sorts of um, uh, different business opportunities. And Carl Icahn is actually an interesting character. Uh, he's the 26th richest man in the world. And I would say that his opinion, but it's the same as Warren Buffett's. Warren Buffett has the same opinion uh, that these are American businesses and they, they will rise again. And so there's a real opportunity to buy now. The only thing you don't know is if they're gonna fall a little bit more and you don't wanna, you know, of course do that. But I would say, uh, for instance, the, the, the Dow Jones is something like 21,000 right now when it was almost 30,000 two months ago. Uh, I think it would be very painful to cut lower and uh, I guess we'll see. But I wanted to talk about Carl Icahn for a little bit also. Once I read his quote, I thought he was just an interesting character and I think there's an interesting lesson in the way that his life has developed. Uh, so I would like to get uh, go now into the profiles and success, but um, let's take a moment. Okay, well, since we're talking about Carl Icahn and predictions he's making about the stock market right now, uh, I think he's just an interesting character to focus on as somebody for profiles and success. Uh, Carl Icahn is somebody who started as a stockbroker, and he did it for about seven years, and then he uh, had an idea about how to grow in his industry. And what he did was he took some of his own money and he reached out to a family member for more money, $400,000, let's call it $4 million in today's money. And they purchased a seat on the New York Stock Exchange and they were able to start their own hedge fund this way. Uh, and there's just a very basic lesson about the way life works and how to get stuff done. Do it well for a few years and then uh, you're able to show investors something. Now it's true that this investor for Carl Icahn was his uncle, but I'm not sure that matters. I'm not sure that this uncle would have invested if it was a bad idea or if young Carl hadn't shown that he had some aptitude for this work. And then Carl also had the excellent idea. He said, well, why don't we take responsibility for our, our industry? And this is a terminology that I think I like to use over and over again because it means, yes, I'm trying to grow. Yes, I'm trying to get bigger and all of this. But when you grow in an industry or when you start a business at all, what you're actually doing is taking responsibility for that industry. You know, I'm going to be a player. If you make movies, if you want to be a movie star, 
You can hope that they give you a job as a movie star, or you can write your own script. This is you taking responsibility for the industry, and it gives you immediately more power. It puts you in a much more uh, powerful position to negotiate and promote yourself and uh, uh, have a, a quality reputation. Um, and so that's what he did. He said, I want to own a piece of the, of the exchange where I've been working for the last several years. Probably anybody who works on an exchange sees this lofty position and says, I want to go there. So what's the difference? Well, a seat opened up to this young broker and he said, well, I have this much money. And at least he had money. I mean, a million and a half in today's money, is that a lot of money for seven years work for a stockbroker? I don't know. Maybe. I'm sure there was people around him who were making even more. Why are they not the 26th richest man in the world now? Well, it's because even though they were performing well in the role that they had, maybe they didn't save their money. Or maybe they didn't think of that, that clever move to get to the top. He had a track record. He had a clever mood to get to the top. He was able to present it to an investor. True, it's his own family, but that really doesn't matter when you're talking about this much money. That uncle would not have given it to him without belief. And so then he gets up there. Before you know it, he's taking in clients' money. Now he's able to uh, corporate raid. He's able to buy out companies. He's able to force them to make moves. Uh, the biggest move I know that he's ever made was uh, forcing uh, PayPal and eBay to split. He thought PayPal has a lot more value by itself than eBay has. Uh, and eBay is holding down the value of PayPal. They need to split so that PayPal is free to go pursue other options, trying to become a payment processor on Amazon, for instance, which eBay would never allow if PayPal had stayed under their umbrella. So he bought a position in PayPal and he uh, threatened to sue. He did all of the tactics that hedge fund managers can do when they want to force a company to make a move, a publicly traded company to make a move. You can't force privately traded companies to make moves because somebody owns all of it. Uh, Reddit will never be forced to sell one of its uh, subsidiaries because somebody owns it privately. But he uh, became a major player in the industry and he made good move after good move, good move after good move. And just like Dale Carnegie last week, who made this empire of education uh, and helped hundreds of thousands of people live better lives and have better careers and run better businesses, there was that pivotal moment where he went from nobody to somebody. Now you could say that him getting the job as the stock broker is uh, going from nothing to something. Well, I agree with that. But I would dare say that becoming a stockbroker is not so exceptional. Maybe it showed some effort over time. Uh, you have to prepare your image. But you're, you probably get in the door with a hundred other guys or girls. You are part of this class. And, you know, some of them will be successful, some of them will fail. But most of them will not have the eye for the lofty position. They will not have the, the, the inner fortitude to prepare an investor's pitch. He needed that additional money, and so they made a company together, and they took responsibility for their industry. It's the operative concept. It's the thing that makes people most afraid to do big moves like this. Not because maybe it will fail, even though that's part of it. It's if, if I succeed, there I am. I'm in this life. I have this burden on my shoulders now. Maybe my pockets are full of money, but it's a heavy weight I have to carry. And that's what responsibility is. That's what be, uh, having a business is. They should just change the name of business. They shouldn't call it business anymore. Uh, what, uh, what do you have? Well, I have my own responsibility. I have my own ongoing concern. That is a common term in business academics. Ongoing concern. I'm always concerned about this thing that I've built. And so I think if you realize that this is a fear that's holding you back, if you realize that the fear of responsibility is the thing that's actually stopping you, not the fear of maybe your efforts will fail, 
It's not that scary to fail because you can just try again, but if you have responsibility, you're crushed by it all the time. But if you know this, if you prepare yourself for this, if you uh, envision yourself dealing with this ahead of time and you know emotionally you're, uh, you're ready, then uh, you'll be much better off. So remember that businesses are responsibilities and the difference, and it's not just about being successful in your current position, but imagining that higher, that higher place and making a strategy and a pitch so that other people will help lift you up. Anyways, um, he's 84 years old now. He's telling us that the stock market, in, at least in his belief, with all of his advanced information that he pays for and the advice and the, the, the flow of knowledge that comes through his organization, which is going to be cutting edge, uh, that this is something for now, but it's not something for later. The biggest risk of this whole coronavirus uh, episode is human reaction. How we're responding to it is the biggest risk of all. And I think that's what you're seeing in the stock market right now. Do I think the stock market is underpriced now? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. You couldn't make a mistake right now buying in the stock market as long as you buy it and hold it for a year. But anyways, uh, I invite you to review Carl Icahn. He's just another guy that uh, has just made bold move after another. And his initial move, I would say, is a lesson for all of us. Thanks for coming to our podcast this week. And uh, please subscribe. And uh, we're going to have something even better next week. I'm very excited as usual. And um, I really appreciate you coming to hang out. Have a great day.